do is take a stimulant be before you submit your final paper. Isn't that correct, Jim? Oh, yeah, I've done that before. I've heard about that. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. It's six o'clock in the east, three o'clock in the west. Those of you in the east coast should be eating and not listening to me, but thank you so much for uh, coming and hanging out. Um, those in the west coast, um, hopefully you're not too hot. We know there's been lots of heat your way and lots of uh, health issues, so hope you're staying well and healthy. Um, as you can tell, I've got some former students here who are still mad and angry at the grades I handed out. So this one is grade free, but there is some CEUs attached to it. Um, I will. Um, take some questions um, throughout the presentation. Um, I can't see you. I'm, I'm on full PowerPoint presentation, um, but do, um, if you have a question, jump in and hopefully I'll have some time at the end before tonight's um, uh, award ceremony to answer some questions as well too. Um, eating and drinking is allowed by all means. I'm not gonna tell you what to eat or drink, but eating and drinking is certainly allowed during the presentation. So let us talk about um, what's vital to your life, which is sleeping, dreaming, and of course, drugs. And if you were Dean Anderson's presentation today, without drugs, none of us have a job. So thank goodness for drugs in our lifetime. Understanding anxiety dreams. You're late. It's been moved to another building and you're supposed to introduce the speaker. So one of the beautiful things about what I do for a living, it really helps me be um, not prejudiced um, because I see differences in skin color and in sexuality and in ability. I see all those things, but I don't see any of them. And it's not that I'm colorblind, is what I see is the most precious thing you own. And the most precious thing you own is not your 1968 vintage Camaro. The most precious thing you own is your brain. And when we look at the brain, is that we've all got basically the same brain. Now, they're all unique and special, which you can tell by the early comments. There's all sorts of interesting characters on the call today. But our brains, in essence, the structure of them, the way they function, and what they're comprised of, is universal for every human being on the planet. And this is why this cartoon, which in fact, I use cartoons because it activates a different part of the brain, especially when you've been at a conference all day long, it gives you a different sort of um, chemical reaction in there. Um, to make this point is that when you see this cartoon, you're late, including people I'm admitting right now, you've moved to the building, you've been supposed to introduce, those anxieties are culturally specific, but they exist universally. Every culture we've talked to, every culture we've recorded has these issues of anxiety, right? So what is a major issue in our society right now? Um, this is not going to happen to you after my class today. There's going to be no issues of insomnia. Everyone will be very tired afterwards. But insomnia is a major public health issue. Um, it's got a huge impact on our well-being, physical, social, psychological, interpersonal, um, all of these issues are directly linked to our inability to sleep, right? our inability to sleep. You don't sleep, and this will be on a slider along, you don't sleep, you die. It's as simple as that. So that's what gonna be the theme of this. Sleeping is life, which is quite ironic. So a question, you wanna think back about what the most important historic change has been in the world in the last 50 years. I'm a bit older than that, but What's the most important historic change in the world in the last 50 years? Okay, think about this, put an image in your mind, and I'm going to tell you what the most important historic, it's not Branson going into space, right? It's not the creation of the internet, that's peripheral. It's the fax machine. Some of you who are not that old don't know what a fax machine is, but the fax machine changed the world. It changed the way we live. And so what are you talking about, Rick? So a couple of important things happened. Right now, we are connected in a way that even five years ago, we couldn't be connected. This whole notion of Zooming and Skyping, really brand new technology. But really important and something that we as a species have not caught up to yet is the move to industrial revolution. And you're going, what are you talking about? We're well past in North America, the Industrial Revolution. We are. But guess what part of us has not passed the Industrial Revolution? Our brains. Right? So you got to think about it. For, again, I'm an evolutionist. And so for hundreds of thousands of years, human beings in all their forms around the world lived on a sun-moon cycle, right? Sun came up. We went to work. 
sun went down, we would huddle around in our small communities, our tribes, our groups, our communities, our walled fortresses, wherever we huddled around and would wait for the sun to come out because when the sun was out, the predators came and would eat us up. And then something miraculous happened. The light bulb. And the light bulb suddenly, in the span of a single generation, changed the way all human beings in the industrial world and eventually most of the world lived. Because now there was electricity. There was the notion of there was no day, there was no night. You could work around the clock. And if you go back to this picture here and this little point I make to the left here is suddenly we had a whole burst, a whole burst of industrialization, industrial accidents, and industrial deaths. And so we had people who were not working moon, sun. We have people that are working today, 24-hour shifts, or sorry, 24 hours around the clock, 12-hour shifts, night shifts, you know what, continental shifts, those horrible 3 to 11 shifts, night shifts. And I'm not sure how many of you work residential care, have worked overnight shifts, and know what it's like to try and get through those. Now, of course, you got to go back to the turn of two centuries ago and trying to get through that with no safety equipment, no WSIB, no WCB, right? And just literally thousands and thousands of people being killed. And part of that, of course, was because they were literally, the original meaning of the word dopey, not the word, diction word of dopey, is they were tired, they were fatigued. And so when human beings have a problem, we're creative, we come up with solutions. And of course, one of the first solutions was for insomnia was drugs, was drugs. So here's this fax machine. And why the fax machine changed the world yet again is important to light bulb. So those of you who are as old as I am um, would know that I worked for an organization called the Addiction Research Foundation, now the Center of Addiction and Mental Health. And we know that um, in the old days, my boss was in a different city, would call up and say, hey, Rick, I need a report. And I'd say, no problem. They call up on a Tuesday. Boss wants to report on Tuesday. I'd wander around. I'd go talk to somebody, you know, maybe answer a crisis call and do something important as opposed to write a report. And then I'd sit down and write it. I'd take it over to my secretary. Actually, important enough to have a secretary. My secretary would type it up on a typewriter, would hand it back to me. I'd stick it in an envelope, maybe on Wednesday afternoon, stick it in the mail, and it might show up on Monday. So I had a whole weekend to worry about what I'd written or not written. And then the fax machine comes along, right? And suddenly the boss calls you at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning, and they're expecting that report by 11. So you got to write it. You got to get it typed. Your secretary has to throw everything else off her desk, type that up, and you got to run over the fax machine and try and put it in there. And so suddenly our time frame changed yet again from having a pace of work where we didn't have to respond immediately. And I know every single one of you on the call today has a smartphone or equivalent. And now suddenly, and you know when you email somebody, you text somebody, and they don't get back to you, like in six minutes, you start getting anxious. What's going on? Are they ignoring me? I'm not important. And so you need to think back to like the mid 19th century. Our brains are still trying to catch up to the light bulb in terms of being able to respond. This is a multi generational phenomenon. It's literally going to take forever, wow, a couple thousand years for us to catch up to this. But now the technology has again escaped our biology. And so when you feel fatigued, when you feel anxious, it builds on that natural state that already exists of anxiety, right? So why bother sleeping, right? It's important to understand because addiction to psychoactive drugs impacts the brain activity while we're awake, but also when we're asleep. And the impact of drugs on our mental health and our well being is not only while we're awake, but while we're asleep. Our waking lives, our ability to function, depends on our ability to sleep. If I want to write a murder mystery and find a way to kill you, not that I want to kill any of you. I would do so by stopping you from dreaming and they'd never catch me. So thank goodness I don't have murderous intent. 
So I've been chased and I realized it was graduation. I hadn't taken the exam and I looked down and I saw I was naked. Margaret experienced the traduction of anxiety dreams. Again, think about this. Have you ever had one of these dreams, right? You were going to school, but you hadn't taken the exam, right? And you weren't ready. You couldn't find the exam hall. Have you ever found that you were naked or somehow publicly embarrassed? Those are universal dreams that literally you will find examples across culture around the globe that people have these sort of thematic dreams. They're universal. All right, so now I promised you, I promised you a little bit of opportunity to see if you want, those of you who read the chat before we started. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm looking to look at all of you. And if you wanna throw up and be brave enough. So I don't do dream analysis. I'll tell you what dream analysis is not my, uh, my bag. Um, I certainly respect cultures that do this piece, but if you've had a recent dream and want to share it, I'm happy. And we've only got one screen here. So you're gonna, I'm going to look at the screens here. So you, I'm going to flip through the screens. If you want to put your little hand up, I'll call on you and you can share a recent dream you've had. And I will tell you what it means. Hi, Rick. Hi. Heather, Heather, go ahead. You're up. I've had recurring dreams and it's always, I wake up and there's a bear looking in the window at me. There's a bear. And my bed is right close to the window. It's not in, it's not a real life, but in my dream, my bed is right up against the window and there's a bear looking in. Heather, you're an A. That's a, always good to be an A, Heather. Well done. <laughs> Heather's an, an, a. A, every, an A, everybody. Anybody else want to, oh, Hugh, I see your hand go up. Hugh, go ahead. Okay, I won't, keep, I'll keep this short. But I have this dream in a few different variations, but I'm somewhere on a dock or by the water and I see money on the bottom and I go diving down there and I pick up pieces of money, gold coins or something. Oh, good for you. Good for you. That's a good dream. I'm not, I won't do the analysis, but unfortunately you're nothing special. You're just an A as well, Hugh. But again, A is always a good place to start off in a class. Anybody else brave enough to tell us what they're, oh, Esther, I see your hand up. Go ahead, Esther. Yes, thank you, Rick. Uh, I had a dream that uh, someone was chasing me, really chasing me with a knife and I was running and every time I hide and and he could find me and I kept on running, but he never got any me, I woke mm -hmm. up. Thank goodness you woke up because I don't want anyone catching you. You're doing some work for me. Esther, you're a you. You're a you, Esther. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy being a you. I'll tell you what that means. Anton, I see your hand go up. Hello there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in recovery myself, yep. but this dream I have, I've often had clients tell me that they've had it similar and it's of me using uh, drugs, but it's, I'm not getting high and, and I, I almost do. And it's this struggle to do it and it keeps on failing. And it's this uh, struggle to, to either, you know, get it done or to, to obtain it. And um, this, it's like this agonizing pursuit. Yeah. And then, or I've had it when I did do it. And then this, overwhelming feeling of shame and guilt and fear. Yeah, absolutely. And so that is an intersection of A-type dreams and H-type dreams. And as you said, they are extraordinarily common for individuals with substance use backgrounds, substance misuse backgrounds. And I'll tell you about the importance of those. And we're also going to talk about ways to address them as we go forward. Anybody else want to chime in on this? Yeah, Rick. Go ahead, Don. Don here. I've been in recovery in 14 years now. Good for you, Don. Well done. And uh, my drug of choice was was cocaine. I think you know that. And, yeah. and very similar to what the other gentleman was saying is that it's when you're helping people in addictions all the time, right? Every day, now you know how it goes, right? You're a counselor. It just keeps going. I, I had a reoccurring dream of the same for years that I was in a crack house mm -hmm. and everybody was doing what they were doing. And I was sitting in the corner and I wait, every time I wake up, I'm so proud that I didn't die, that I didn't use. 
every time. And yep. this uh, this has lasted. It pops up every three or four months. I I tell people about it because I think you know it's kind of strange, but it's just it still occurs. It's, so it's, it's almost too, like trauma or something. Yeah. Like. Well, you know what? Don't say it almost is like because it absolutely is. And I'm going to talk about the role of dreaming as part of recovery and counseling because you're absolutely right, Don. It does link to trauma, and we can use counseling to help with dream resolution, which is what you've done. So you're you're an A as well, Don. It's a very classic A dream, but you've got to resolution which is lots of people in recovery haven't got to. And interesting enough is the dreams we remember and the dreams we don't remember can still be triggering. All right. Thanks, everyone, for, for that. Um, you've got, hit some really important themes here. And I'm going to put back my, my share. All right. What do you dream? So the classic A dream. So the bear dream, the money dream, and the drug dreams, those are classic anxiety dreams, right? And I'm going to tell you about the importance of anxiety. You have, unfortunately, been sold, and no offense, I'm, again, I'm a social worker by background, I'm a neo-Marxist, which is a good or a bad thing, depending where you come from, is that, which just means I appreciate the role of capitalism in our society, right? I've got an RSP, I like capitalism, it's going to allow me to retire in 15 or 20 years. But the notion of anxiety is the fundamental human resting state, right? So if you look at advertising, you look at media, look at TV and movies, right? They're always trying to give us happy endings, which is good. And the reason it's good is that the natural resting state of humans is one of anxiety. Thus, when you're at sleep and your conscious brain is relaxed and your brain allows to process freely, where do you return to? You return to your natural resting state, one of anxiety. So anxiety in our dreams is one essential. And I'll tell you why it's essential as you move through them. The using drug dreams are also H dreams. And these are historic, right? And so some of you have dreams about relatives that you haven't seen for a while. I'll have a dream about my grandmother every now and then, and she's giving me a hard time, which is what my grandmother did, but she's passed on now for 20 years, but she still shows up in my dreams, right? That's a historic dream. Some of you dream about something that happened in high school or a sporting event you're involved in or something you're very successful. Those are classic historic dreams, right? Your memories are all there. They also include together. There'll be two different memories that have nothing to do with each other thrown together. Remember, you're unconscious when you're sleeping. Your brain is active, but things still come together. Uh, no one gave me an RH. An RH is a, a recent history dream, and that's something that happens today. And so like it or not, you will dream about me tonight, which should scare most of you. And most of you, thankfully, will hit the delete button and forget everything I've said. But hopefully some of the important elements will seep into your memory. So your brain isn't a computer, right? We don't remember things verbatim. Everything is seen through a lens of our stance. But every night when you go to sleep, your brain decides what's worthwhile keeping and what's worthwhile throwing away. So let me think for just a second. What did you have for lunch on May 12th? May 12th. Just think about what you had for lunch. Anyone? Anyone May 12th? Yeah, who cares, right? Who cares? Your brain doesn't care. You ate lunch. You had sustenance. You had nutrients. Your body kept moving forward, and it moved along. It wasn't like you had an uh, anniversary meal or graduation. You know, nothing wasn't special. It's May 12th. Who cares? But if I ask you to tell me one embarrassing event from high school, Boy, I bet you can think of more than one because those embarrassing events from high school determined how we would behave or not behave because no one wants to be embarrassed in high school, right? No one wants to look like silly or a fool or be picked upon. So we do something that we're embarrassed by. Boy, remember, don't ever do that again. And I got a lot of high school embarrassing memories that come back quite quickly. So recent history, what do you save and what do you delete? So again, if you dream about me tonight, it's not a nightmare, it's natural. And then when um, Esther was talking about the chasing dream, that's a classic universal dream. That's why it's a you dream. It's a classic universal. And again, people around the globe, I've, <clears throat> if you went back and looked, almost all of you at some point in time that remember your dreams will have had some sort of chasing dream. So those are universal. So those are the primary types of dreams that exist. So as I began this presentation, I said, anxiety is a natural resting state of human beings. 
it is where we are. So those of you who remember my pharmacology course, those who haven't taken pharmacology, they should, is that the primary neurotransmitter in the brain is GABA. And what GABA does, it reduces our anxiety. It's our natural, God-given neurotransmitter that reduces the amount of anxiety we have. But no anxiety, no life. If we weren't an anxious species, we wouldn't be this advanced, right? Think about it. We're certainly not the fastest animal on the planet. We don't have long, sharp claws. We're, nothing, we're not good at fighting, really. We're actually poor fighters. I mean, us against a great white shark, and no, no deal. I mean, us against a bear, as long as the bear's on the outside of the house, it doesn't matter where our bed is, right? The bear's not getting at us. We're still safe from the bear, but the bear is an anxiety about you know, our threat to our life, right? And so we do things to minimize our threats. And so this notion of anxiety, and any of you who played hockey or had kids play hockey or played reggae, they always taught the kids when you go into a corner to get a puck, head in the swivel, right? Look around, see who's coming in at you, making sure no one's going to hurt you from behind. Well, all of humanity is head in the swivel, right? We're always looking at what danger is, who's a friend, who's an ally, and that level of anxiety, that fight flight, that's ground into our central nervous system of who we are. Apparently, some sort of chemical balance. I'm happy all the time. You know, if you're happy all the time, you have a very hard time surviving in society. You really do, because we need to be anxious. So what happens when we go to sleep? As I said, you've had a day full of input. You've got five different senses. You've had just hours today of information, some of which is relevant, some of which, okay, my presentation is, yeah, some relevant, some, what the hell is he talking about stuff going on, right? And so your brain will decide what's vital for survival. What is vital, the most important things to help you deal with the anxiety of living? What's important for you to remember? And when I talk about survival, for me, when I read something, what's important for my survival is knowing about drugs. So I'm reading stuff about drugs all the time. I'm doing some research about drugs. And that's the stuff that's retained my memory because that's for my survival. I need to be able to do presentations like this so I can feed my family, right? So sleep equals delete. What do we save? Because there's always way too much input, especially now. Again, those of you my age, think about the pace of life prior to the internet and the pace of life prior to smartphones. I think I got like 42 text messages from Hoover today, right? Oh, I got to respond to messages. Someone's going to talk to me. Really? Is that, am I that important? I need to respond to 48 text message. Truly not that important. And so during the sleep period, we're trying to delete all of this information that's unessential and retain what's essential. That's what's going on when you're sleeping. But that's only part of it. There are five stages of sleep. And these are the five stages of sleep. And there's nice, the, the, the PowerPoint slides are written down. There's nice, nice little discussions of all of these. But I'm going to stick with this diagram for a while because I love this diagram. So number one, right off the bat, it shows you that you've been told to sleep eight hours. Eh. Everything I'm going to talk to you now from now on is based on the normal curve, right? The normal curve is what majority of human beings fit across, right? We all know there's exceptions across the normal curve. Many of you in this audience are exceptions. And so everything may not perfectly apply to you. Many of our clients and service users are exceptions. But this is the norm for humanity. And this is what people, again, across the globe go through. This is the basic sleep cycle that you should go through this evening to varying extents. And you'll see there's five stages. And interesting enough, this is REM. This stands for rapid eye movement. This is the dream cycle. And stages one through four, they're called NREM, non-REM. To give you an idea is about in a typical night, you'll be asleep and dreaming for maybe an hour to an hour and a half. And the rest of the time you'll be in these stages one to four. This is called REM. REM. This is called NREM. How much more important this phase is compared to this. So let me walk you through what's going on here and explain to you why sleeping is so important. So, and we know all mammals sleep, all mammals sleep, um, varying lengths of time, but this is human beings. So let's start with stage one. Stage one is your transition sleep. Stage one is when you're sort of falling asleep and waking up. This is more than likely the stage you are in when you remember a dream. Right? As you get older, you have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. Often it will be at the end of a dream cycle, remember a dream. You'll have a nightmare and you'll wake up. 
but you're really waking up that this transition point between REM sleep and stage one. This is when there's a noise in the house, you'll have a little nap jerk, your body will move along. It's that light stage of sleep where you're easily woken up. Stage two sleep is transition sleep. It is deeper and you'll spend a large amount of your time in, in trans stage two sleep. Stage three and four, and you'll notice why I love my brain and why I love my body. Stage three and stage four sleep occurs in the first three hours. And we all know, I start talking about insomnia, right? Lots of us don't get seven, eight hours sleep. Lots of our service users, especially in recovery and withdrawal, don't sleep large amounts of time. What happens in stage three and four? What happens in this first three hours of sleep? This is when the primary healing of the body occurs. So if you've broken a bone, right? Say it's 9.30 on a Saturday. Say that Saturday is the, oh, 10th of July. Say your phone rings. Say on the other end of the phone is your son. And your son says, hey, dad, guess what's happening to me? And I go, Alex, what's happening to you? Hey, dad, I'm going into emergency surgery. What happens to the father? The father goes into a high state of anxiety. What happens to the son? The son phones his father four hours later and goes, I'm out of surgery and I'm hungry. My son had emergency appendectomy surgery this morning. So I was a little distracted for a good chunk of the day. My anxiety went through the roof. But I know, I know what's going to happen to him because he's had a big surgical scar. He's had a big operation. And tonight when he goes to sleep, when he's in stage three and stage four sleep, his body is going to start healing the surgery. Right? So those of you who've had surgery, those of you who've broken a bone, those of you who have a simple cut, right? Suddenly, the bone is healed. The cut is healed. The surgery scar is there, but your skin's all tied together. You've had nothing to do with that, right? You're not consciously healing your body. Your body heals itself. And when the majority of that healing occurs is right here in the first three hours of sleeping. And so even if you don't get a full night's sleep, even your sleeping is disrupted, the body, the first thing your body does is goes into this really deep state of sleep. If you've ever been woken up from the sleep because a fire alarm has gone on, you've got a baby and the baby's crying, someone's you know, calling you and their phone's ringing, you know how dopey and groggy you are. This is that deep stage three, stage four sleep. Your brain activity is at its lowest. It at its slowest. Your brain is basically is at as rest as it gets. So this is slow brainwave activity. And again, this is why I think the human brain, the human body is fantastic, is even with limited amount of sleep, your body will be healing itself. Now, of course, it heals itself around the clock. It's always, the immune system's always at work. Your body is always having heal, but this is the primary element. And so when people have really serious injuries, what do we give them? We give them barbiturates to this day. What do barbiturates do at high doses? Slows down the brain activity, maximizes healing time because the brain isn't active. God, we're smart. And so, as, and during these early three hours, you'll see dreaming is minimal, right? Dreaming is minimal. You notice this is blue. I mean, this is the colors we use, and this is red. So here is this transition line between stage one and REM sleep. And you notice these little peaks. What else you want to walk away knowing today is, is that when you are dreaming, your brain is actually more active than when you are awake. And again, if you think back to your dream, sometimes in a dream, if you remember it, you will live weeks and months in a dream because your brain is going full force. The other fascinating element occurs is when you start dreaming. And again, remember, we're going to talk about drugs ultimately here, is that this is all out of your control. You don't control the healing process. You don't control the dreaming process. This occurs to us on a part of being our biology. So this happens regardless of what we do. And so here's the dreaming part, we're dreaming. And again, over the course of the evening, there's more and more dreams. This is REM, because it stands for, not the band REM, but rapid eye movement. Literally, during these periods of time, right? and you'll notice each dream cycle is longer and longer. Each dream cycle lasts a little bit more time. Um, over the course of the evening. The body is paralyzed. So those of you who sleepwalk, you're not dreaming. Right? 
I don't know, my younger son used to sleepwalk. You have to put things in front of the um, um, blockages in front of the doors when we were on road trips or on baseball trips so he wouldn't wander in the hallway. We actually found him once knocking the door, we let in and had no memory of it. Anyway, so at this point in time, the body is paralyzed. There's actually a chemical that's released that stops you from physically acting around because your brain is active. And it's called rapid eye movement because if you're lying beside someone that's sleeping, you'll literally see their eyes going back and forth, scan the horizon. The brain is active. If you're a Star Trek fan, it's like a holodeck phenomenon, right? Your brain is active and ongoing. Your brain is moving. Your body is physically moving, except it's paralyzed. And thus, if the, that didn't happen, you'd be actually getting out of bed, flying around, running around. So again, evolution, gotta love it. I said, if I wanted to kill you, I could quite easily do it. So we, uh, if you've been to a sleep clinic, they'll put little electrodes on your brain and they can see these different sleep cycles going on here. And literally they can see the rapid eye movement and see the brain activity. So several years ago, since we can't do this any longer, it's unethical, is that when a person got to this beginning dream sleep, they'd wake them up. Now they let them cycle back through one, two, and three, and one, two eventually. But every time they woke up, uh, sorry, they started dreaming, they would stop the dream cycle and put them back to sleep. They had to stop the experiments after two weeks because the people were acting as if they had schizophrenia. They were psychotic. They were starting to lose touch with reality. Now, let's make a quick jump here. Those of you who work with people who have cocaine and crystal meth runs, right? People who haven't slept for three, four, five, six days. What happens? The behavior becomes er erratic, right? Obviously, the drug has part of that. But if you're not sleeping, and your brain doesn't have a chance to recover and heal and dream, you end up in a psychotic state. Crystal run, coke run, you don't dream, you, sorry, you don't sleep, you don't dream. Same sort of thing happens. It all makes sense. The biology links together with the dreaming. So this is the cycle I want to talk about, is that resting in the first three or four hours, dreaming, right, up to an hour and a half. And now, of course, the kicker for us in our field is that literally, Every single drug, psychoactive substance, has an impact on the sleep cycle and on the dream cycle. Some are marginally positive, majority are problematic. We also now know that many of our service users have concurrent orders. Now, I mean, some of them are this mental health issues brought on by the drug use, but also there's a significant minority of individuals who have a mental health issue, and then they use drugs as a way to cope, respond, deal with the other medication they're given. So if you've got a mental health condition and you're taking drugs that disrupt your sleep, and I've just told you that sleep disrupts your mental health, what does that mean? Exactly. You exacerbate existing mental health issues by taking psychoactive substances that disrupt the sleep pattern. The other cool thing, again, seven hours. My partner, Debbie, who I've been married to for 35 years, and yes, she's the most tolerant person on the planet, um, was about this, about seven, seven and a half hours sleeper. She's retired now for a couple of years. She now sleeps on average nine hours a night. God love her, I can't do that. But say last night, you're all excited about coming to conference and you only slept five hours. And tonight after listening to me talk, you're dead asleep, right? So tonight, if you have a typical sleep of seven hours. But last night, you only slept five hours, which means you really didn't go through your whole dream cycle. You only really got through this one. This last really important dreaming didn't happen. Tonight, if you get a typical seven hour sleep pattern, what will your body do? It will squeeze in five dream cycles. I don't know the science behind it. I don't know anyone knows why this notion of four dream cycles, about an hour and a half of dreaming a night is sort of the best, quote unquote, optimal, normal, average sleep cycle. That's what it is, being an hour and a half of sleeping. And if you didn't get it, your body tonight will sneak in an extra dream cycle. So you'll sacrifice some of one and two. You won't sacrifice three and four, because again, the body loves you. But you'll sacrifice some of those, and you'll be a little more spiky in your pattern. And you'll have five dream cycles to make up for your missed dream cycle. The other thing, and again, you need to consider the clients you work with, the service users you work with, you can see your own lifetime. The other thing that's really cool is napping. I'm a huge napper, love napping in the afternoons. 
Um, I also listen to my own voice that puts me to sleep as well too. But what will happen in naps is you don't see this pattern, right? If you haven't slept like five or six hours in the last evening and you grab a quick half hour nap, you won't have this cycle. You'll go right from one into a dream. And so often when you've, if you remember, if you had an after, after nap, you have a dream, this is your body making up, right? No control over you. This is just natural biology of your body trying to keep you awake and alive. You will have just basically one REM sleep and then wake up, right? That half hour, 20 minute nap. Your body loves you. And I've got little notes here about all the sleep cycles. So if you download the PowerPoint, which is there available for you, it gives way more detail about all of this cycle as well too. So what happens if you don't get enough sleep, right? Disrupted sleep or sleep deprivation leads to all sorts of both physical and mental health issues for the reasons I've been talking about. And if you can sleep, but you don't enter REM, and this is important, many of the psychoactive drugs people use, particularly the depressants, like alcohol, the benzos, uh, even antihistamines, right? They will make you drowsy. They'll put you to sleep. But the kicker is you don't have normal REM. You don't have normal REM. And so while you're sleeping, resting, right, you don't have that psychological healing that dreaming provides you, that dreaming provides you. Again, no dreaming death. You can go longer without food than without sleep. So water is important, right? We, we dehydrate really fast. You got to have some water. Think of a drink right now. Mm. Water is life-sustaining, especially if you're from Hamilton drinking Lake Ontario water. Anyway. Water is number one, dreaming is number two, food is number three. And yet no one talks about this, right? No one talks about this. So water, sleep and dream, food, and that order to sustain life, to sustain life. So I'd mentioned this, and two of the people who are very brave to share their dreams, um, Don and Anton, thank you for doing that. Um, is that processing traumatic memories and dreams. There isn't a whole lot of good science, and I am a social scientist. There's a lot of decent anecdotal information. And based on the chart I just gave you, there's some value to this. So nightmares have a correlation to reoccurrence of drug use. Our nightmares, our trauma, our unresolved anxieties. So people with PTSD, people with really problematic substance uh, misuse histories who are, are, you know, had a lot of tough times using the reasons they use and in recovery, right? Those are nightmares where they wake up, you're in that cold sweat, right? And it's important because drug use, as we all know, causes trauma in our lives. Trauma leads to drug use, but the drug use sure as hell doesn't make it any better. What do we dream for? We dream to heal psychologically. So of course, our trauma is going to be in our dreams, right? We've already talked about anxiety dreams, universal dreams earlier on, and then the historic dreams. And again, we had two examples out of five. So 40% of the examples given were this connection to drug use, right? Drug use. And so because anxiety is what we resolve in our dreams, anxiety is our natural resting state, what we can do then and I know you've got tons of things to do in counseling. I know you've got groups of individual work and you've got limited time with the people you're working with. But this is a really under-examined area. People sleeping, their nightmares, their traumas. And again, I'm not doing dream analysis here. I'm saying your dreams are what you have lived. You relive your dreams, relive your life in your dreams. And those dreams are to help us deal with our anxiety, to help us to delete and recall. And nightmares and traumas are stuck memories. They're unresolved memories, which is why when Don gave an example, he showed us what exactly can happen. You've got this reoccurring dream and it's never going to go away, but you can resolve it. You can have that happy Hollywood ending, or at least you can wake up from it and say, not using now. I know this is a dream. I know this is my anxiety. It's goodness in my anxiety. I'm worried about this. I don't want to use again. What are my tools to not use? So this is an asset for you. Another asset, another tool for you in your counseling, right? Is working through dreams and counseling 
to resolve the trauma. And again, it can be the trauma of why people were using in the first place, really important. If that's not your scope of practice, certainly find a counter that will work with people in dealing with the anxieties of their trauma. Because without resolution, it'll continue to be a trigger. We all know that. That's nothing new you're learning from me. But likewise, right, this notion of reusing the dreams is that how can we help people when they're awake say, look, you've learned all these great relapse prevention techniques. You've learned not how to use. So I want to remember those. Remember what recent history goes into memory. Some is deleted, some is not. So in the counseling, we give them more recent history. Let's go over all your relapse prevention techniques. Let's go over all the skills we've given you. Put them in your memory so that when you're dreaming, you can perhaps link those two. And if you can't, when you wake up, what you want to do beside your bedside, here are my relapse prevention techniques. Grab your book. Okay, I know I was dreaming about using again, but I know I don't use because, 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 because. And we now build up the skills we give while people are awake to support them in their dreams. No dreams, no psychological recovery. Trauma in our dreams, we wake up afraid, disrupts that dream cycle. So again, part of a larger picture, a larger function that we really haven't developed or thought about that carries on with all of us because we all dream. If you don't remember your dreams, that's fine. You're still dreaming. If your service users don't have nightmares, that's fine. Not an issue for you. But as we know, we're going to have many people who have disrupted sleep, particularly in the early stages of cessation and obviously through withdrawal altogether. Again, not a lot of research, but some recommendations. And that's all I have for you. I don't have a way to tell you how to practice, but here's another tool for your toolkit. If you've got people who are not sleeping well, who have recurring uh, reused, reused dreams, deal with them. Don't ignore them. This is what's, if people are waking up and afraid to go to sleep, they're not gonna recover. So let's deal with the issue, right? Draw the nightmare, literally. Piece, piece of paper and pen beside the bedside. Draw the nightmare, write it out. Give it meaning. Tell, as we did today, it doesn't have to be elaborate, right? Very quickly, you can say, okay, this is anxiety. This is a historical dream. This is a universal dream. It's got nothing to do with your drug use. Everyone has the falling down, flying dreams. Forget those, right? Everyone's got the chasing dreams. But here are the dreams that we can talk about. Have the person describe the picture, right? And then draw the dream with, here's the techniques you use when you're awake. Apply them to the dream. Lucid dreaming is that state where you know you're dreaming and you walk into your dream. And so to this day, to this day, I have the dream where, and it was in one of the cartoons, where I'm late for my exam, I haven't studied for it, I don't know where it is. And I literally now, when I remember these dreams, and who knows how often they occur, but I still remember them on a regular basis, I literally walk into that dream and go, hang on a second, I don't have to take the test anymore, I give the tests now and I wake myself out of the dream, the anxiety is gone, right? And I go back to that 68 Camaro dream, hopefully. But again, just another thought and something we haven't done a lot of good work with is helping people get through the night and not be afraid to go to sleep. Um, people often ask about sleep paralysis. This whole, I haven't got a lot of time because there's so many of us today. And it's the end of the day and you're all falling asleep on me. Is that sleep paralysis is something totally different. It's that... Um, it's this phase right here, it's this line where sometimes people wake up before that chemical in the bloodstream that's stopping them from thrashing around and running around in their dreams is totally cleared. And um, the problem is sometimes the chest feels quite heavy. And so if you know people with sleep paralysis or literally paralyzed because the chemical haven't left their brain um, and left their body yet, it literally all you wanna do there is, is um, deep breathing. That will clear itself quite readily, readily you will never suffocate in sleep paralysis. You'll feel a, a tight chest or chain chest. Um, simply here, breathe, relax, and wait. Breathe, relax, calm with shift workers. And oh, look, those with disrupted sleep. Who have disrupted sleep? Drug users have disrupted sleep. I told you this before, everything's about anxiety, right? We've got a whole bunch of anxiety disorders. And these, if anyone has one of these, these are again exacerbated by a lack of dreaming, 
and they're exacerbated by drug use, right? By drug use. And again, the whole list of anxiety disorders here and PTSD disorders, they're all made worse by drug use. Again, something you already know. So the response was initially historically, right? I'm writing a prescription that will give you a new freedom and a new happiness. Do not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. You'll comprehend the word serenity and you'll know peace. So what's our response as human beings? We have a problem. We give you a drug, right? What should we be saying is that we've created artificial needs to wake up and go to sleep. This notion of a nine to five, a 7-Eleven, whatever shift you're working, I mean, that's all made up. We know the problems when we have daylight savings time, right? That one hour shift, accidents go up, people are more upset, uh, mood is impacted. That's a one hour shift and we're all messed up. We're talking about getting rid of daylight savings time. And so the question is to relax about not sleeping. If you don't sleep the one night, right? You'll sleep the next. But what occurs, people with insomnia, they start worrying about not sleeping. The anxiety builds upon itself. Now, of course, there's biological reasons for insomnia, but majority, of course, are psychological reasons. Issues on your mind, trauma, fear of sleeping, fear of nightmares, fear of dreams, all those issues go into it. So we need to normalize the fact that, no, you don't need to sleep seven hours, sleep five hours. Do you have the ability and the power in your day to have a morning, afternoon nap? Can you have a nap after work? Yes, I only sleep five hours, but if you sleep two hours there, there's your seven hours. And I told you that if you do have that half hour nap, what happens, boom, you typically move into a dream cycle to deal with that psychological healing. Okay, the body takes care of itself if you give it space to do so. But you know what? That's complicated. It's new thought. We really only knew about this for the last, what, 15, 20 years, maybe. Maybe get a grasp on that, but we had drugs for way longer than that. Oh, drugs are good, right? Using psychological drugs alters sleep. More importantly, alters dreaming. It has profound effects on physical and mental health. I read that because I want you to hear it from me. I want you to see it. It's your takeaway. As drug use impacts physical and mental health through dreaming. We already know the stuff it does while you're awake. It doesn't go away until the drugs clear the system. It continues to impact you. So here are your basic depressants, right? Set of hypnotics, benzos, uh, Z drugs, bar barbiturates, non-barbiturates, seven hypnotics. So we'll see a whole lot of those. Antihistamine solvents, and of course, alcohol. So what's happening here, right? So number one, these are really good for stage one and not bad for stage two sleep. They put you to sleep, they make you drowsy, right? We all know, we all know, but many of us know a couple of beers too many and your, you know, your central nervous system is slowed down. Well, so is your autonomic nervous system, right? That controls your dreaming, slow down. But here's the kicker, right? I told you about healing. I told you about my son's scar that needs to heal. So I'm gonna to talk to him later on tonight, um, see how he's doing. Um, in the stage three and four, the physical healing part, the part when withdrawal and recovery are really important as your body has been beat up by your drug use, right? Guess what? Restricts the amount of time. So all these drugs, right? And again, remember, benzodiazepines and barbiturates. Barbiturates, right? barbiturates were made, were created as a primary mechanism to help with insomnia, right? To deal with anxiety. Benzodiazepines came along a half century later. Z drugs came along 40 years after that, but all the goal is to help you sleep. But I just told you, they know they help make you drowsy. And drowsiness and sleepiness and sleep are two different phenomena. So yes, you are asleep, but you're not in stage three and four. And I've already told you, boom, that REM sleep is negatively impacted as well, right? And so I've got a whole variety of comments here for you that tell you step by step by step, what the different drugs do, what the different amounts do. Now, thankfully, we don't see a lot of barbiturates in our daily life. We do see lots of benzodiazepines, right? Valium, Halcyon, Dalmain, Ativan, Xanax. We see a lot of that. And again, as it applies, stage one and two sleep are induced. You're, you're drowsy, boom. Reduces physical healing, suppresses 
right? Reduces REM sleep. So these drugs were made early on. Again, barbiturates over 100 years ago. Benzodiazepines were produced now 75 years ago without knowledge of the sleep cycle. They saw people sleeping, they thought it was good. Sleeping is good, but the nature of the sleep is more important to understand. And again, I've got just one study here is that Xanax really knocks you down fast. Um, lost 40% of its effectiveness and ended up with rebound insomnia. And as we all know, there's no cheating our bodies. So with any depressant that we take that slows down our central nervous system, slows down our autonomic nervous system, when we stop taking the drug, there's a rebound. So the irony, of course, is we drink alcohol, we take Xanax and Ativan to help us fall asleep. But the second we stop taking it, we get rebound effects, which are increased insomnia, increased inability to sleep. So we get the opposite impact going forward with these drugs. So in essence, any one of your service users who is taking any type of central nervous system depressant to aid with sleeping is in fact harming their physical recovery time and harming their psychological recovery time. And that's across the board. Then when they stop using all that rebound, so they don't sleep as much, right? There's more anxiety, but now that, wait, there's more to this, is during that time where they're taking the drug, they're already impacting states three and four and REM sleep. So impacting physical well-being, impacting dreaming. And now in withdrawal, it's even worse. So why do you think people in residential care and withdrawal management are restless? They have been taking care of themselves physically. That sleep has been disrupted and now they're in withdrawal, which is a, intensifies the lack of physical and psychological sleep healing when they're sleeping. It is just one big negative feedback loop with all the depressants when it comes to sleeping. The only time this is good, if you've got a kid in the back of your seat and you've got to drive 16 hours, throw a little gravel in them, but then they'll know they'll be whining when they wake up. And I, of course, never, never support um, these. And again, I've got little notes for you as you take away all of these, but you'll see the same sort of thing. More state time in stage one and two, less in stage three and four. All of these drugs work the same way on the body. They're all the same family of drugs. So when you look at the research, same thing across all of the drugs, right? All the drugs, same element across. Same thing with all of these, disrupts it. Um, this last point is a key takeaway for you. Um, again, many people who enter our treatment programs figure, hey, I'm here, I'm gonna be better, everything's fantastic. Have a look at this. For chronic alcohol misuse, and again, we know it takes a couple of years for people to really get back into rhythm, but we haven't always appreciated why. Well, here's another thing that you can add to your education program, why they're going to have a problem getting all the way back and feeling all the way, quote unquote, normal when they're in their recovery process is inadequate state sleep can persist for up to two years, right? And so, yeah, the body starts coming back to homeostasis, coming back to balance point really quickly. The body loves us, but sleep is part of that autonomic nervous system. We don't control it, and that is impacted at a far different level than our central nervous system, than our thoughts, our consciousness, our rational brain. That's all changed in a much more dramatic manner. So in supporting our users to go to relapse prevention, to stick out their relapse problems, to understand why a lapse, right, is not a failure, because their brain, right, it's like the brain trying to adjust to the light bulb. It doesn't happen in a generation. Adjusting sobriety doesn't happen, right? In three, four, five, six weeks. It's a whole process, but it's a process not just on a conscious level, it's a process on that autonomic nervous level as well. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> opioids, we know we have an opioid crisis in this country right now. One of the reasons people take opioids is to mask pain, and it's very, very good at masking pain. One of the secondary effects of opioids is, of course, sedation. And we all know that from our lovely pharmacology courses. But what you don't know, right, and why opioids are such a risk for overdose, it's again, it's got to do with sleep. It's a sleep presentation. Of course, it's got to do with sleep. 
many opioid receptors are in the same part of the brain that's responsible for sleep regulation. You overstimulate the part of the brain responsible for sleep regulation, right? Slow down the breathing, induce sleep, too much opioid, the overdose, of course, is a cessation of breathing. So again, the sleep receptors are very much connected to the opioid uh, receptors in terms of where they're located in the brain, which is why we induce sleep. Um, we see again that there's a shift in the sleep-wake um, cycle. People who are opioid dependent, we know are again, more sedated, more relaxed. But here's a key in the yellow, in the bright yellow for you. What? While decreasing total sleep time, sleep efficiency, right? That's the amount of time, overall sleep time that's spent in stage three, four, spent in REM sleep, right? So three, four is your delta sleep and REM sleep. So the sleep efficiency, how much of your time is really dead zone time where not, nothing's good happening to you is increased with opioids. So spend more time sleeping, but that time, stage one, stage two, right? Not meaningful sleep, not healing sleep, not restorative sleep. Every dose of a potent opioid can reduce stage threes and four. So we've sleep. So again, here's the irony. We take opioids for pain. Opioids were always intended for acute pain, right? Short-term limited pain. We now have chronic pain, chronic back pain, back injuries, traumatic accidents. And so we're taking the opioids. What happens, people obviously become dependent upon them, but it also affects that healing stage as well. So you're already injured and beat up and in pain. And this level of injury is one the body cannot heal from. So it's not like if you stop taking opioids, you get better. I mean, this is that crushed bones and vertebrae injuries and lower back muscle injuries that they, they don't go away, right? You have to live with the chronic pain, but these drugs don't help, right? They don't help. And so we do need to look for alternatives to chronic pain. And of course, we all know on a tangent here is that the issue for many individuals is they take opioids to deal with emotional pain and opioids are for physical pain, right? Anyone taking opioids for emotional pain, right? That's where dependency cycles occur as well. And I've got some notes about just the various drugs here. Methadone uh, is important. We have many people in harm reduction programs. I'm certainly a huge fan of harm reduction. I totally support both opioid and suboxone, both the oral and the pill, and now the injectable options. I'm in total support of all of those, but I'm also in support of individuals reducing their dependency on methadone and suboxone over time if they can. I mean, there's a whole different lecture I won't get into, but one of the reasons I support this is one is that you want to control the drugs. You don't want the drugs ever to control you. Um, but again, methadone, suboxone, they're opioids. They're going to behave the same way all the other opioids do. So it impacts sleeping and dreaming, just like any other opioid. In early use, methadone reduces the length and the amount of REM sleep, delays the initial REM episode which means you'll start dreaming till later on in the cycle. So right off the bat, again, you're switching from one opioid to another. It's all those other problems with the morphine, the Oxycontin, right? The fentanyls, all those problems, they are not changed by methadone because the pharmacology of methadone is exactly the same pharmacology, base pharmacology as all their opioids. So the disruption to states three and four, disruption in REM sleep. And again, I am pro-harm reduction. I'd much rather have somebody take methadone, suboxone than using needles, than you know what, trying to sniff fentanyl, right? So there's not a question about that. It's just that those people we put on methadone for 30 or 40 years, whose benefit is that? Is it their benefit or society's benefit? And again, stage three, four sleep. The, the message is the same here. I just want to let you know that it applies to all the drugs, nothing special about one or the other. Um, stimulants. And again, we had an answer about what do you do to get through Rick's presentation at six o'clock Eastern time? You take a couple of stimulants. These are all our list of stimulants, all nicely laid out there for you. Every single one of them, including our friend caffeine, right? We take them to help us stay awake. I mean, that's the role to help us stay awake. All of these, right? Is to give us energy, to give us focus, to give us concentration and to stave off sleep. Why is that? Well, 
because we don't sleep enough, because we take our phones into our bedrooms, because we have TVs and computers in our bedrooms. I'm not going to do a sleep hygiene thing for you here. But the bedroom is for a couple of basic things. One is sleeping, two is having sex, and three is sleeping. Well, that's two things. Never mind, right? It's not for entertainment. It's not for recreation. I've been teaching students by Zoom for the last 16 months. And these students are, their classrooms are their bedrooms. So they are trying to figure out why they're having issues. And we know there's a whole thing about COVID dreaming, right? COVID dreams, anxiety, obviously, right? Re repetitive, can't escape a trauma, ongoing ailments. But you've got people who are working, living, it's my students, working, living, sleeping in the same environment. They never shut things down. So anyway, sorry that was tangential, but you know, those who know me, you always get a couple of tangents from me. Um, all of these disrupt the sleep cycle. Right, I talked earlier about the Coke runs and the um, speed runs, the um, crystal runs, um, classic examples of disruption. Very simple. Every single one of these, your Ritalins, right? your ADHD drugs, decongestants. So those of you who uh, have bad colds and do take decongestants, even the very simple decongestants, you will see the labels saying, you know what, will not, uh, will cause heart problems increasing the cardiovascular system, guess what else increases? Blood flow of the brain. Increase blood flow of the brain, you don't fall asleep. You want blood flow slowing the brain so you can sleep. Not stopping, obviously, but slowing down. That's what helps us sleep. The more you rev up the heart, the more you rev up the brain, right? And that's consistent across all the stimulants, right? And so I've got, again, look, stage three and four is affected. REM sleep is affected. Um, Sleep disruptions, deprivation, methamphetamine. Unwanted side effects, delayed REM sleep periods. Again, so kids and adults who are on these drugs, their first dream cycle will be delayed, which means that longer 30 to 60 minute, that last dream cycle may not be kicking in. So what happens, sorry, I'm just gonna run, run right back here. What happens when you delay this one, it pushes everything back. So, why do you need eight, nine hours sleep is if this dream cycle isn't going to happen until here, and this one gets pushed back, and this one gets pushed back. This is why you end up with people who are on drugs like Concerted Ritalin needing to sleep longer because their whole sleep cycle is messed up. Oh, but wait, these are kids, and kids have to catch the school bus. And kids have to be up at 7, and they're going to bed at 10. But wait, they've got their smart. You see the cycle? It all goes back to the light bulb. It all goes back to the fax machine. It all goes back to how we spend our time and how we do we disconnect, right? And here's the irony, without technology, we wouldn't have this conference. Yet I'm gonna tell you, tonight when you're done going to the award ceremony, shut it all down, put the phone away, put the TV away, shut it down, right? You're gonna be tired and fatigued from a day long of learning, listening to different voices, not being able to interact. But your brain's gonna buzz. And while you will be sleepy, right? If you keep adding that extra stimulation, it's like throwing a little more Ritalin in there, right? Shut down the appliances, make the room dark, limit your sleeping area for a couple of core functions. Smoking, same problem. Caffeine, no offense, same problem. This is why you're told, right? When you get older, like me, Don, not like you, but when you get older, like me, um, you cut the coffee off because it takes a while for the caffeine to metabolize. And when the caffeine's running through your body, it's gonna impact, and certainly not like cocaine and not like bath salts, nothing like that, but it's gonna disrupt three, four stage. And it's gonna disrupt the REM a little bit, not a whole lot. But then when you can't fall asleep, you get anxious about not falling asleep, then anxiety, you know, think about how do I fall asleep? Boom. So next year I'll do the whole sleep hygiene presentation. Hallucinogens are interesting because they're not like other psychoactive drug groups, right? They're not like. Um, full disclosure, full disclosure here. Um, there's a couple of um, companies in Canada that are um, psychedelic therapeutic companies that are, are marketing LSD and um, MDMA and psilocybin. And I bought shares in both those companies. I haven't made any money. I just got shares in them. I actually believe that this is going to be a huge therapeutic breakthrough if we use it clinically and not recreationally. Not an advocate of recreational drug use. That's, again, another presentation. 
We'll talk about policy sometime other time, but certainly in terms of the hallucinogens, not cannabis, the hallucinogens, working on serotonin and the value of having serotonin boosts is wonderful. Again, acute, not chronic use. Chronic use of, of MDMA and LSD and psilocybin, there are certainly issues with that in terms of serotonin being impacted in your brain and having what we call um, suicide Tuesdays, right? Having the serotonin burned up in your system. But acute doses of these drugs, again, when we get the clinical dose levels, we don't have those yet, right? We're working on it right now. That's why I bought stock in a company so we can encourage proper use as opposed to recreational use. Um, but LSD actually leads to longer time spent in REM on a short-term basis. Chronic use of LSD, chronic use of psilocybin, chronic use of MDMA, in fact, has the opposite effects. It's the same thing we see with cannabis. Short-term use has some therapeutic use. Long-term use, not good. Look, everything in moderation. Again, nothing new from Cernic here, but short-term use, yeah. Don't throw this away. Don't be Richard Nixon's we're on drugs mentality with these drugs. Really have an open mind to the appropriate therapeutic use of these drugs, particularly because we know that LSD and psilocybin do not produce physical dependency. And so there is some work to be done here. Baby and bathwater metaphor. Keep an open mind about this. This is going to be a drug with great therapeutic potential. But remember another drug that had great uh, therapeutic potential, that drug was called Oxycontin. It had fantastic therapeutic potential. It still does. Just don't crush it and stick it up your nose, right? So again, open mind. And if you want to give me a hard time when I'm done in about eight or nine minutes, go ahead and give me a hard time. But I'll defend it based upon proper pharmacology. Um, same thing, MDMA. Um, why not as good as psilocybin and LSD? Well, MDMA it fits into a different category, right? Fits in a different category. The LSD-like drugs, uh, LSD, LSA, which is um, Morning Glory Seeds, LSD, they've got no secondary effects. When you start getting into the ecstasy, the MDA, the love drug, that's got secondary stimulant effects. So not nearly the same level as obviously a cocaine or amphetamine, more like a, a, a cappuccino, not coffee, more cappuccino. But again, you're revving up the system. So while MDMA is going to have some therapeutic utility going forward, we've seen it with PTSD, we've seen it with depression, right? There's some good clinical trials out there already. Again, small, acute doses. But the sleep drug, hate to tell you, sleep drug, oh, those people taking shrooms out in BC, you know what? They knew something that we didn't know. Uh, ketamine, special K, PCP, no one does PCP, let's pretend it doesn't exist. Um, increases non-REM sleep, intensity and duration. Ketamine is a disassociative anesthetic. PCP, a disassociative anesthetic. What's an anesthetic? Something to put you to sleep, right? It's what, they didn't give ketamine to my son today, but they gave him anesthetic when they had surgery, knock him down. Um, doesn't increase or decrease REM sleep, but end up with more violent dreaming. So I'm certainly not a big advocate of ketamine as a recreational drug or a therapeutic drug, but again, just to keep an open mind in developing nations, in third world nations, because ketamine works so quickly as anesthetic, it's on the top 10 of the World Health Organization drugs. It's used here primarily in North America for small animal and large animal veterinary medicine. So it's used here. We don't give it to humans because we have better alternatives. But again, ketamine in small therapeutic doses under a properly trained physician's guidance, psychiatrist's guidance, can help with depression when people are resistant to more traditional antidepressants. Um, again, when it comes to REM sleep, it's sort of um, um, neither a win or a loss. These dark guys are a loss. These guys are a win We're going forward. Then we got our friend, right? We got our friend. Thank you, Justin. We've got our friend cannabis. Um, yeah, again, those of you who've used cannabis in the past, those of you who have service users use cannabis, know that cannabis makes you dopey and sleepy, right? Fall asleep faster, hits that, really enhances stage one sleep, increases slow wave sleep, that stages three and four. Is it healing yet? We don't know. But if you're spending more time in stage three and stage four, that is healing sleep. Again, 
this is being recorded. I want to be very careful. Cannabis is not a healing drug. THC, cannabinoids have and demonstrated multiple therapeutic utility, including stage three and stage four. So yeah, if you want to get, I mean, do what you want to. It's Saturday night. It's been a long day of conference. You want to go use some cannabis. What do I care? Stay in your basement. Don't drive a car. But in terms of CBD, yeah, it has potential. We'll know more in four or five years right now. Again, I'm not saying it's healing. I'm saying if it's increasing stage three and four, we know delta stage is where the body recuperates. But, but as THC use goes up, as THC concentration goes up, REM sleep goes down. Cannabis is the perfect paradoxical drug. In small amounts, it's got great therapeutic use. In large amount, it's got great potential um, problematic use. So it's that balance point in time. So small doses, particularly cannabinoids, but also THC in small doses, doses helps three and four. In large doses, boom. REM goes down. Physical healing, psychological healing. Why do our clients, why do our patients, why do our service users use drugs? Many of them, of course. Of course, it's because of trauma. What do we need to resolve trauma? We need to sleep deeply and to dream. What does THC do in large amounts and doses? It decreases REM sleep. Yeah, psychotherapeutic agents, again, many of our individuals have concurrent disorders. Um, and again, depends upon the drug. Um, they can both enha enhance and harm. Lithium for people who are young, lithium increases stage four in sleep while REM sleep is decreased. Again, these are some of the issues is that you'll find that many of the psychotherapeutics will help with one phase, but the another, um, the antidepressants in general, the minor antidepressants typically aren't a pro problem. They will promote sleep, right? And uh, mediate the wake promoting effects. So they're helpful with serotonin, particularly the antidepressants are helpful with serotonin. Uh, again, not advocating one way or the other, but in terms of REM sleep, um, it's, it's a trade-off, it's a balancing point too. So these are not certainly not a throwaway. Um, and we know people who have depression, you, uh, important for them to deal with that and not um, and not struggle through that mental health issue. So psychotherapeutic agents, uh, again, a balance. Uh, lithium for people who have serious mental health issues. Um, again, there is the dream wake cycle. There's not enough negative um, feedback. There's not enough negative to say, don't do these drugs. These drugs, their value when they are properly prescribed and properly assessed, right, underscore proper, um, they seem to be not an issue when it comes to sleeping and dreaming. And I do have a couple of notes on sleep hygiene that's not about right. The lack of sleep is linked to depression, anxiety, increased pain perception, mood disorders, and heightened emotional state. People with trauma, right, all an issue. Getting adequate sleep is important. And here's some tips for you to take and please use with your service users, right, as you move forward. That's it, that's my song and dance. I've got a few minutes to take some questions or to take feedback or to be yelled at if you think I was wrong. Uh, anything that you wanna raise, please, this is your opportunity. Rick, it's yeah. Jim Walton. Hi, Jim. Um, I have a question because I live in a, in the, as you know, I live in the um, Northern Territory. Yep. And uh, what we have, we have a very different situation. Sometimes there are on two occasions of our year where we have uh, 24 hour darkness for a period of about eight to 12 weeks. Yes. And we also have a uh, 24 hour light yep. for approximately the same amount of time. Yep. And uh, what, what is a, a common phenomenon there is, that uh, many people get what's called turned around and so what they'll what will happen is their cycle of life will switch from what would be considered an eight o'clock in the morning day to a five o'clock in the afternoon day to an eight o'clock eight o'clock at night day to five o'clock in the morning day 
And it's very simple and very easy for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to tie that into um, binge drinking or uh, other other forms of drinking that occur greatly in the north, yeah. Um, for for, and for a multitude of reasons, uh, how do how do you come back from that type oh. of thing around this, the sleep deprivation and the sleep sleep cycles? And those types of things. Yeah. So you've got three intersecting things here, Jim. So the first thing I'll ask you is how much of that is an issue with the indigenous population and how much of that is an issue with the transplanted population? It, it's an issue with both, actually. Okay. okay. Because the indigenous population, they quite they're quite aware that they may they may become uh, turned around. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's happened for thousands of years. Okay. That some people would become turned around in the community. So people work to try to re re change, change that, but also when before um, businesses were there or in a, a, um, a capitalist economy was there, then nobody worried about whether they went hunting at two in the morning or or slept was were sleeping at two in the afternoon yeah. because it didn't really like there's no such thing as time really. Yeah. It was light and dark. That, that that's your answer, right? I mean, the answer is the light bulb. Right, until we start notion the fact that you've got to sleep at two o'clock in the afternoon, you can't be up at two o'clock at night. Like who make those rules up? You're right. So it's, and again, I'm not, as you well know, I'm not an expert on Inuit culture whatsoever. I'm very naive. And that's yeah. why I asked about them because they are not the normal population. They live in extremes of light and dark. Right. And if they've been there for thousands of years, they will have adapted. So my quite, I mean, notion is absolutely, is that this is an issue for them. Um, encouraging sleep patterns when they can sleep is turn around, is that, um, is that a physical issue? Is that a, a cultural issue for the sounds of it? It's really a social issue that came along afterwards and was before we had commercialization, before we had to go to the grocery store at a certain point in time, they slept when they slept, they were awake when they were awake. Yeah. Right, yeah. and so the, my answer, and then this is a really cheap throwaway answer, Jim, we'll talk more about later on, is that if, you know this, if we can restore traditional patterns of culture, right? Because again, the light bulb has been around for 200 years. Their pattern of living has been around for thousands of years. We've tried, right. we just played with their biology for God's sakes. Yeah, right? and, and, and to, be, to be fair to the culture, uh, a lot of this stuff didn't start happening until the 1930s because for a lot of this stuff. So the answer my question, my friend. Happen with that. Yeah. So here's your answer. You know this answer, right? Support traditional culture there's a reason Absolutely. they lived the way they lived right yeah and not the way we lived in southern climates uh, susan your hands up i'm happy to talk to you hi thank you very much that was an awesome presentation i've learned so much i have a quick question um first one is is there such a thing as too much sleep <sighs> yes people who are emotionally um depressed who are clinically or psychologically depressed will spend time in bed and not sleep. And that tends to be that stage one or two of their sleep. It's not really that healing sleep. So yes, you can spend too much time in bed. And again, remember most of the time in sleep is stage one and two, which is non-healing sleep. So yes, you can spend too much time there. But again, my example of my partner, my wife, um, when she was working, she slept on average seven hours. And when now that she's retired, she sleeps on average nine hours. And she's so much nicer to me now that she sleeps nine hours. So um, we all need the question about what is our natural sleep cycle. And it goes back to Jim's question, right? When we went to indigenous cultures, we said, said oh, you've got to work on this cycle. Um, and my reason for this fax machine and light bulb is, is everyone's got their own natural sleep cycle. We're just not allowed to find it. And again, with my wife being a great example, when she stopped being in school, when she stopped having to work, she found her sleep cycle. And she's jealous of me because my sleep cycle is about six and a half to seven hours. She says, you're always doing more. Yeah, yeah I'm just watching Netflix. I'm not doing anything important. But yes, the short, the short answer is, yes, you can sleep too much. And I, I remember my grandmother always used to say that it's the sleep that you do before midnight that is really helpful. Yeah. Um, and, you know what? and I would never argue with a grandmother's wisdom ever in my lifetime. But when, when it's midnight where your grandmother is, it's 6 p.m. where I am. So again, it's finding your own sleep cycle, which is really important. It's what's natural for you is that's important element to take away from this. 
So it John, doesn't really matter if, if you no, it doesn't matter when permanently is, shifted. Yeah, yeah, it's permanently shifted. Again, um, I, I'm on a west, I'm on a west coast time shift. I find it really hard to fall asleep much before one o'clock in the morning. And if I could, I'd sleep till ten o'clock. But I can't do that. I have to go to conferences. John, I see your hand is up. Go ahead, my friend. Yeah, I was um, looking at and, and going to ask your opinion on therapies that work with rapid eye movement, I, EMDR, accelerated resolution therapy, and their impact on, on this. Yeah. Anything that's trauma-informed that helps deal with trauma, I'm in full support of. Most of the stuff I've told you today in terms of counseling around dreaming, it's all uh, in infant. Most of the, most of the dream, um, dream, most of the sleep psychologists are really focused on the biological piece. We really haven't moved into really knowing which um, therapies work best. So again, I don't have an article or series of research I can tell you, but trauma-informed EMDR certainly has some value. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer says, I got 10 minutes. I have to stop talking. So EMDR, the, the trauma piece that I've talked about as well too. Narrative therapy as well, retelling the story. I'm a big fan of. I don't have any literature though. I'm just a big fan of that in helping people re-see the way their lives are. But yeah, John, work with trauma-informed and that would be a good foundation. And again, I go back to solution-focused therapy. If something's working, do more of it. If it's not working, try something else. Sandra, give me my last question because everyone's got to go off to get something to eat before a award ceremony. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I was just uh, curious about uh, the pharmaceuticals like um, Zopacone and Imavane, and if they fell under your category of benzodiazepines, even though they're not really benzos. They're Z drugs, yeah. And so they're better, but they still see some disruption. Yeah, they're okay. better. They're better. They're the next generation of them. Um, and But mm -hmm. a benzo is a benzo. It's still, it's still playing around with REM sleep. Um, okay. I, I would prefer that to a Xanax, no doubt about it, but I would prefer, again, work on sleep hygiene. Um, I'm not an MD. That's not my background. I'm never going to able or am I qualified or do I ever want to tell someone to take this drug or not take that drug? But I'm always wondering about what the utility of the drug is, right? And so I went to Dean Anderson's session this morning and I put something in the post. It's not why are people doing drugs? It's why aren't people doing drugs? And so what is it that prevents people from taking some of those substances that they still struggle with sleep, but can still sleep? So, um, yeah, so I believe you- I was just gonna say there, there was a recent study done yep. here in Prince Edward Island, yep. um, just the over-prescribing of, of uh, Zopoclone and Imavane. It's just <sighs> catastrophic in all groups of people, not just seniors. Yeah. So it's really bad here. It's, it's, again, I'm a social mm -hmm. worker from Ontario who's a neo-Marxist. Okay. It's a cheap fix as opposed to dealing with the underlying issues. Yeah. But that's yeah. me. Okay. And I don't only well, stock of pharmaceuticals. Um, I think my, e I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. And I say this all the time and I mean it is that because I'm a lonely person during COVID, if you've got a question down the road, um, I will answer it because I need to have my ego fed. So um, let me just make sure I send it to everybody. Everybody. There we go. And feel free to email me if you have any questions and I'll make up an answer for you. Thank you for sticking around so late tonight. Do have a good night's sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm.